I think we'll jump into it. So hi, everyone that is joining us, or if you're watching this recording on YouTube, thanks so much for tuning in and checking this out. I am so excited to be chatting with incredible human Sarah Thomas today. She is a world record holder. She is no doubt the world's greatest long distance swimmer. And we are speaking with her today as part of our Learn More series talks that we do every month. And this month is Women's History Month. And so we have a seriously amazing woman with us and just incredible swimmer beyond gender as well, an incredible athlete. And so thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. As a ex-swimmer from a different part of my life, I'm definitely very excited and honored to be able to speak with you but a lot of um, what we'll hopefully explore today won't necessarily be from a super specific swimming background I'm excited to explore the water and obviously your incredible achievements but just for anyone out there that isn't very familiar with No More Under I am the program director and we are a non-profit based in Bellevue Seattle well sorry Bellevue Washington also near Seattle but I'm actually in Fort Collins, Colorado right now. So I'm just down the road from Sarah, only about an hour apart. And at No More Under, we focus on water safety awareness and drowning prevention. We have a lot of programs that we are working on and so proud of. We support access to life jackets with uh, permanent life jacket loaner stations. We just last week launched, launched our free Learn to Swim program for families in affordable housing organizations. So we're so proud of helping make swimming more accessible for our community. And we have other initiatives as well, but part of what we try to do is just create conversation around water-based things. And this month it is celebrating Sarah Thomas. So Sarah, thank you again for joining us. And I want to first just highlight a couple of your successes before we jump into your journey. For people that don't know, Sarah has swum for 67 hours straight. And I was doing maths and maths is not my strong point at all. But that is basically like getting up at six o'clock on Monday morning, swimming nonstop through Monday, Monday night, Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday, until basically Wednesday night, uh, midnight, sorry, just before rolling into Thursday. And I checked that like four times. So I'm really hoping my math is correct on that because it's, it's just less than 72 hours, which would be a full three days. But she swam for two days and nearly three days. It's unbelievable. That was 104 miles which for our Kiwis or other uh, people that are not familiar with the imperial system, that's 167 kilometers, 167 kilometers, 104 miles. Absolutely incredible. And on top of that, Sarah is the only person to, I just saw someone write, wow. And yes, wow. <laughs> and Sarah is the only person to have ever swum the English Channel four ways. There, back, there, back. Absolutely incredible. And that one was 54 hours. So still more than two full days. So just absolutely incredible achievements. And on top of that, Sarah has had incredibly uh, intense health challenges. And so to come out of that and be this incredible person from prior to the health challenges, prior to these huge swims, just always being a hard worker. And so I would love, Sarah, to learn about how you got into swimming and where did this whole journey start for you? Ooh, starting right at the beginning. Um, let's see here. <laughs> the, the, well, the ongoing joke in my family um, is that my mom was um, pregnant with my little sister and we're 13 whole months apart. And oh. so by the time I was one, she had me in swim lessons because she was so hot from being pregnant in Kansas in July. So um, swimming probably started like about the same time that I could walk, um, just took to the water, loved it. My grandparents had um, a cabin on a lake in Oklahoma and just grew up in the water, on the water, playing in the water, being pulled behind boats um, and then joined the swim team um, on the summer league team when I was seven nice. and then year round when I was nine and then I just never stopped. <laughs> 
That's so awesome. And when I know you said it was because your mum was so hot, obviously <laughs> living living down there, it's whew, it's toasty. But I'm sure that part of getting into those lessons at the early age was the was the safety part too. And it sounds mm-hmm. like your family was around water quite frequently. So it was obviously something that your parent or parents felt it was important to get you and your sister into. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I have like memories of like two years old and my mom, you know, hang onto the side of the pool and practice your kicking. You need to learn how to kick. You need to learn how to float. Um, Cause we were, we were in the water all the time. Uh, by the time I was like six or seven, I was that really obnoxious kid. Like when we were at the lake and like, mom, I'm going to go jump off the dock. And she's like, you can't go down without an adult. You have to wait and you have to put on your life jacket. And I was like, I don't want to wait. And I don't want to put on my life jacket, but we had rules that I had to follow, but I um, was happy when I got older and we could bend the rules just a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Rules are good though. Well, especially around lakes and docks. <laughs> yes. 100%. <laughs> and so Was that where you built your love for the open water or did that come later? That came a lot later, shockingly. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I grew up in Texas and our lakes are not really all that inviting to swim (laughs) in. Um, And it was like a time before the internet. So you didn't really hear a whole lot about what people were doing in other places in the country. So it wasn't really until like after college, um, I moved to Denver and I joined an adult swim team, a master's team that I even knew like people did open water swimming. Um, wow. And I was, you know, I'm just like swimming. I just joined the swim team for fitness and there's this guy on the team and he's like, yo, you got to do open water. Like, <laughs> he's like a California surfer dude. So he, you know, and he's like, you got to do it. You'd be so good at it. You'd love it. Um, and it took him like a year and a half to like convince me to try a race. Um, and I did it. Um, it was a 10K. It was my first open water race. Um, close to you in Fort Collins, actually. Oh. Um, in Horsetooth Reservoir. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's a 10K. So if you swim the length of it. And I was like terrified. Like, I don't know if I can go that far without stopping. You know, like I'm used to standing up in the pool and training that way. And it's like, all of a sudden you got to go, you know, a couple hours um, without standing up. And I loved it. It was amazing. Like, I was freezing and I got a cramp in the middle of it and you know all these like crazy things were happening and then I got out and I was like in tears because I was like this is the greatest thing I've ever done um and that was in 2007 um I was 25 um so I haven't looked back that's incredible wow I as someone who used to swim in a pool I have not tended to the open water myself but that must have been just such a big transition and every every tumble turn, you know, you're getting that little bit of that, not a break, but that wall space where you're just doing a streamline as opposed to your arms just moving, moving, moving. So I, wow. And to have grown into that and be nervous or not nervous. I I can't remember what what exact word you said, but to be unsure about a 10 K and then be the world record holder and have swum 167k I mean that's that's 16 times I can do a little bit of math on the spot not too much that's nearly 17 times further that's incredible I would love to hear about your growth in that mindset and so you know you were unsure about 10k so how'd you get to 20 and then where did it go from there yeah um I was um, unsure is a nice way. I was terrified um, of that first 10K, um, like absolutely like sweating, nervous, like sick, all of the things. Um, I used to get like pretty good pre-race jitters before swim meets um, and like sitting in a room full of like people who are, were all about to swim the 10K. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this is possible. Like, I don't, what did I sign up for? You know, like I was, I was legit a wreck. Um, so to come out of it, you know, I, I, you know, obviously conquered that fear and, you know, stayed in the moment and loved every single second of it. Um, enough that like when enrollment came the next year, I was like, I'm going to be the first person to sign up for this race. Like I was so excited. Um, like I'll, I mean, truly I'll never forget because um, enrollment opened on like April the 1st and I was like April the 1st at like 1201 I'm like online so I can like sign up for it I was (laughs) I I was so excited about it um part of it is 
you know, and this contributes to the journey. So I, I am answering your question, I promise. Um, but there are like this open water swim community is just like, they're amazing people in general. So like I'm sitting in that meeting for that very first 10K and the race directors um, have people stand up. Like, is this your first time? And so like half the room stands up, right? And you can see like, we're all terrified, like looking around. Um, but then they have people like, who has swum at 20K, who has swum the English Channel. Uh, and so like, and then all of a sudden you're in a room with people who have swum the English Channel. Um, and it's just like mind blowing. Um, I know like as a younger kid, like in high school, like you always say like, oh, I'm gonna climb Mount Everest. I'm gonna swim the English Channel. You know, like just those things that kids sometimes say. Um, and so like, I'd always said, oh, I'm gonna swim the English Channel someday. Like not even knowing what that meant or how it was possible. Um, and then, you know, that kind of goes out of your mind when you go through competitive swimming and you don't like think about that anymore. And then now here I am and there's like a handful of people who have been in the English Channel. And it just like, it blew my mind that number one, there's people that do that. And now I'm like actually talking to them and I'm doing the same race that they're doing. And it really just totally opened my mind as to what was possible. Um, so I did, you know, I swam the 10K in 2007 and eight and nine, so three years in a row. Um, and kind of by the time and like the third time I was starting to feel like, okay, I've got this 10K thing down. I want to try farther stuff. I want to try something more. And so um, those people that I've now met for these past three years, um, my, my good, he was kind of a sort of a friend at that point, Craig, um, I emailed him and I was like, hey, I think I want to try to swim the Catalina Channel, um, which is like 20 miles um, between Catalina Island and LA. Um, you know, I've only done a 10K to this point. Craig had done it that year. So like he kind of knew what was up. And so I like just emailed him and I'm like, can I, can I do this? And he emailed me back. He's like, you totally can and I'll help you. Um, and so that is just really where it started. So in 2010, I did Catalina. Um, it took me just a little bit over nine hours, like seriously the longest thing I'd ever done. Um, I was so tired and exhausted. Uh, when I finished, I said, I, I'm sitting on shore and it's like on record that I said, I'm never swimming again. Um, like straight up, that was it. I'm done. Like that was enough. Did this hurt? Like I couldn't raise my arms over my head for like a week. Uh, my tongue peeled from the salt water. It was, it was terrible. It was like the most miserable thing I've ever done. And then like three months later, I was like, you know what? That wasn't so bad. Maybe I should like do the English Channel. <laughs> and so it just kind of snowballed. So I, you know, I did a few swims in the 20 mile range. Um, and then it got to the point and it was like, wow, you know, like I could keep going. Like, this is weird. I know, like, and not a lot of people say that when they finish a 20 mile swim. Uh, so then I just kept taking it. So like I did the English Channel in 2012. Um, in 2013, I was like, all right, let's, let's do some more. So I swam down and back across Lake Tahoe, which is like 40 miles. Six weeks later, I swam down and back across this lake in Vermont, which was 50 miles. Uh, and then I was like, you know what? I haven't met a limit yet. So like, let's keep going. And it, it did. And all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, it's really painful, but then, then you find that you're like swimming 80 miles and hundred miles and the English Channel four times. And it's like, how did you get here? And it's really, truly just step by step by step. Um, learning as you go, figuring out, knowing how to train, working hard, um, and just truly loving the journey. You know, I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't love being in the water. Like that's probably the most driving factor for all of it is I love the water. I love the people. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a really so... long-winded answer. <laughs> no, oh my gosh. I could listen to you talk about that all day. That is so incredible. Oh my gosh. Just to hear that growth. And like you said, it if someone had said to you at that horse tooth race and for people unfamiliar with Colorado, sorry, horse tooth is actually very close to where I live. And so that was where Sarah just mentioned that she did her first ever 10 K. So it's quite nice for me because I know exactly where she swam. But um, if, if you, if someone had said to you at the end of that one, Hey, go swim the English channel, you probably would have, it would have felt really shocking and maybe possibly unrealistic or unachievable but it's so powerful to hear your journey taking those steps right because and that can be related to swimming I know that you know trusting the process and the steps was something that I was always told and 
any other swimmers joining us, but that can apply to any part of life, really. And that's so amazing to hear those steps and to just see a little bit, little bit, just getting longer and longer. And mm -hmm. that's that's so powerful. I'm curious if you believe more that the difference or the ability to grow was your physical strength or your mental? I feel like I know the answer, but I'll ask you. I mean, I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest. I mean, I'm a really good floater. Like I float really, really well. I'm not like a very fast swimmer, but like I, I can float with the best of them. And so I think that, you know, I think I do have some like genetic physical abilities there. Um, but like, if you looked at me, um, I'm not, you know, I don't look like an elite Olympic athlete by any means. Um, so it's not all physical. Like, I, you know, that it's not, I'm not the fastest swimmer out there. I'm not the strongest swimmer, um, but I am really strong mentally. I'm super stubborn. You know, I enjoy the journey of things. Um, and it's not, you know, to me, it's never, ever been about being the best, you know, like I didn't set out to be like the greatest open water swimmer in the world. You know, there's some people that like, that's their motivation. Uh, my motivation is to like, just find out the answer. Like, can I do that? Um, and just because, you know, and there's plenty of swims that are less than a hundred miles that are hard. You know, there's challenging currents or just cold water or lots of jellyfish. You know, there's lots of challenges in between a 10 K and would you say 170 K um, yep. that can really challenge you to say like, can I do that? Because that's hard. Um, and that's the piece of it that I really like. I like figuring out the puzzle. I like training for something, you know, when it's something super cold that adds like a whole other dimension to it. And it's like, can my body withstand that? Um, and then I want to find out. I want to try. That's so amazing. That That is that is such mental strength. That is incredible. And you saying about, you know, the cold part, we do have a question. Uh, they're wondering how do you keep your body warm in those open or those long distance swims? Because I know that the 104 mile was unassisted, which means no wetsuit, right? So you, right. you can't even be wearing a wetsuit. So mm -hmm. how, how do you stay warm? Yeah. I mean, there's no wetsuit in any of the swims that I do. That's kind of the rules of open water marathon swimming is that you have to do it just with your arms, um, swim cap, goggles, earplugs, swimsuit. That's about it. Um, and so when I did horse tooth for the first time, the water was like 72 degrees. Um, I was cold. I was like really freezing when I did that. Um, I was like getting cramped because I was chilled. Um, now, if you popped me in that same water temperature, I would be really, really hot. I would be uncomfortably hot. So wow. just over the years, I have gradually, again, step-by-step step, acclimated to cold water. So the English Channel was like mid 60s. Um, I think that's like 17 C for our <laughs> international just, folks. <laughs> I was just putting it in Google. So 72, that first swim when you got yeah. cold is 22 degrees. Yep. And then what did you say the English Channel was? Sorry, 67? It was like 64, 65. Oh, okay. So that's so right about 17. Yeah. That's a bit cooler. Mm -hmm. Yep. But so when I did that, I wasn't cold at all. Um, you know, wow. that's one of the challenges that when you think of the English Channel, you think of it as being freezing. Um, and I just wasn't, I was perfectly comfortable the whole way through. Um, I'm planning a swim in July, um, and that water might be a little bit closer to 50 degrees or like 10 C. I know that conversion. <laughs> um, so it like, that will be a challenge because I'm not quite, not quite there yet. I'm working on it. Um, so it's just, you train for the cold, just like you train for the physical aspect, right? You spend a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Um, you learn how to rewarm, you know, obviously you're moving physically, so you're not just sitting there and staying cold. Um, you have to make sure you're eating while you're doing that because, you know, you're putting fuel in your body so that you're, you're burning calories so that helps you stay warm. Um, but most of it is just getting used to it. And you do, it's shocking what your body can get used to. Cause I did, I went from 72 and being really, really cold to being really super comfortable at 60 degrees. It's very strange, but it, it happens. Wow. That's so incredible. And that's, that's mindset again, isn't it? Just being so strong mentally and making that decision. You, you made a choice or you, or at least the choice to see what you could do. Right. And that that's incredible. And again, I think that we can all learn from that and apply it to anything. It doesn't have to be even sport. It could be our work life. It could be 
anything. That's so, so cool. I'm curious. And I did, I was listening to a different podcast uh, and you spoke about this a little bit and you related long distance swimming to trail running because of the empty mind, the clear mind and the fact that, you know, if, if we're running at a gym on a treadmill, we might have our um, ear pods in, you know, or they're watching, the, we're watching the TV while we're spinning or, so what do you think about? How do you, how do you go in? What thoughts are you taking in? And then I mean, 67 hours with me, myself, and I, that's a long time. What are you saying to yourself? Yeah, I mean, everything um, and nothing. You know, my favorite pieces of it are when I'm just like zoned out. Um, and all of a sudden, it's like three hours just went by. And I'm like, what just happened? You know, you're just in the zone. Um, that's my preferred place to be is just kind of in the zone, um, listening to like the rhythm of my arms, slapping the water, you know, and just kind of getting into that rhythm and that routine, that's really kind of mentally the ideal place. Um, but, you know, 67 hours, you can't stay there forever. And so, I mean, I sometimes I'm singing songs, sometimes I'm like writing a book in my head or making up stories. Um, I know on the 67 hour swim, we were like halfway through and I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot to email Kim, you know? <laughs> and like, so I'm like thinking about work, you know, like there's just a million things that go through your mind um, in the space of a couple of days. Um, and yeah, and I mean, obviously I spend a lot of time face down training, mm -hmm. so you get really comfortable with your own personal thoughts, right? Like I know myself really well. I've probably analyzed everything I've ever said in my whole life through, you know, whether it's in a swim or a training swim. And so you're just comfortable with your demons. You're comfortable with the dark places. And so when they pop up on a swim and you're like, gosh, I can't do that. Um, you're prepared, right? Cause you've been in a training swim and already thought, gosh, I can't do this. And so you you know, the training swims are probably the most important piece of it because you are, you're training your mind, not just your body um, to get through it. So yeah, there's lots of thoughts going on and sometimes there's brilliantly nothing going on. It's great. That's so awesome. And I know to relate it to pool swimming and racing, a lot of Olympians say that their races, you know, when they had their best race or they broke a world record, they say that they don't remember it basically because they're, they're just trusting their body. They know they've gone through that process. And so definitely seems like even if it's a 30 second race or a 67 hour race, there's similarities there. And that's so powerful to be so comfortable with your thoughts. I think that, you know, we live in a world where we can be connected all the time. And there are definitely mental health challenges and other challenges that come with that the challenge of work-life balance lots of things mm -hmm. and so we don't necessarily give ourselves much time to be completely disconnected and so that's really powerful that you have that skill and the beauty of being able to be completely by yourself I think that that is really powerful again and that skill and that comfortability with yourself is something that I think we'd all benefit from having a, a little bit more of and and having those opportunities so that's just amazing thanks for explaining your thoughts has there ever what's the worst song you've had stuck in your head like if you had a terrible song stuck in your head for a race before <laughs> or sorry a swim. Ooh, yeah that's a good question I don't know um my biggest problem is that I don't always know like all the words to every song mm -hmm. so then it'll just be like one line of something it's like <laughs> yeah. stuck in my head for like hours and I'm like can this just go away already <laughs> like it's like you know like a five second clip just boop, boop, boop. it's like get out go away come back again that's so funny I feel like we all have that but we're not all uh head down for 67 yeah. hours right like if that well, happens we, and you're like driving in the car you just like turn on another song right and you're like all right, right let's let's you know overpower this with something else but when you're stuck in the water you just like ah, go away I think at that point, that's when you just become the songwriter, right? And you just, yeah. Brian, yeah. <laughs> let's go. Totally. Oh, I love that. Someone asked a question, how much did you train for being awake for that long? Because that's actually a great question too. I have i don't know if I have ever been up for 24 hours, let alone 67. Yeah. Um, that question came from a swimmer. So I know those ladies. Oh, I wonder, nice. I wonder if um, Vera and Margaret are um, contemplating um, extra long swims on their end. Um, oh. So, but let's see here. You know, I had all these great plans um, before my really first like multi-day swim. So by the time I got there, I had done um, like 24 hour swim and like a 30 hour swim. And like, 
stayed up that long before, um, like in college or whatever, like I'm really good at not going to sleep for whatever reason. So um, those swims weren't like super intimidating because I'm like, I know I can stay awake for 24 hours. I know I can stay awake for 30 hours. But then when I was looking at my first 80 mile swim, um, it was terrifying because I was like, I don't know what's going to happen after 30 hours, right? Like, I don't know. Um, and I had all these plans that I was going to like, you know, work all day on Friday and then stay up all, fr all night, Friday night, and then go for a swim on Saturday, like had all these like great ideas. And then I just couldn't make it work. Right. Cause I, I mean, I do have a job, I've got a real life and it was like never a safe situation to do that. Cause you know, obviously I'm going to need someone to drive me places. Um, so I just never did it. And kind of more or less, I, I researched, you know, I talked to a guy who trained Navy SEALs and he was like, you know, these Navy SEALs during hell week, you know, that's like a few days long. They don't hardly sleep at all. Um, I started following some like ultra trail runners um, and there's a couple of, you know, super long trail running races where they stay awake for multiple days. So I kind of got to the point um, where I was like, you know what, people do this, you know, I'm reading, you know, like you're not going to kill yourself if you stay awake for three days. Like, at some point, your body will just go to sleep if it's like really that desperate. So you're, I mean, it's not going to feel good. It's not going to be a great thing to, 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 to do to yourself, but um, you're probably not going to die. And so, you know, I just kind of took comfort in the fact that people have done this, they haven't died. Um, and we're just going to see what happens. You know, I, like, I'm probably going to hallucinate. Um, it's probably going to get a little weird, but we're just going to go for it and try it. And it worked out okay. You know, I, I made it I think 56 hours was the first time I did it for a long amount of time and I didn't hallucinate and I was actually pretty sharp towards the end. Um, it took a little bit of caffeine to get me there. I'm not going to lie. Um, I take noon tabs and then there's like a part of them, like there's some that have caffeine in them. So it's like a little tiny bit of caffeine goes a really long way when you're that tired. And um, that's what I do. That's so amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That, and again, it's, I guess that bit didn't have as much training as the water temp or the physical side. I think yep. that's, yeah, because it would be hard to train for numerous, I guess the only way to train that is, you know, force yourself to stay awake. But like you said, you're balancing this with a full-time or a regular job as well. So that's just so incredible and it just shows what you can do if you choose to do it and create that time and space for yourself that's so amazing I just think that what you're doing is incredible I want to loop back one of the first questions was uh one that I'm sure you get frequently but of course uh has to be asked what are your thoughts about sharks and the open water swims I know that I heard one of your podcasts where actually jellyfish were an issue for you or um a ch created a challenge I should say uh, so what are your thoughts with the open water animals that can be out there with you if you're in the ocean? So some of it, you just have to like ignore, right? Like sharks live in the ocean um, and just kind of pray and hope that they don't decide today's the day they want to eat you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been the, probably the sharkiest place I've ever been was um, I did a swim in Hawaii um, between two islands in Hawaii, um, between Molokai and Oahu. Um, there's a lot of sharks there. And I was, I mean, you're thinking about it the whole time. Uh, most of the swims I've done, like the English Channel, there's not really sharks in the English Channel. Um, but when you are in like extra sharky waters, you know, you just, you got to go for it. You just have to let go of that fear. Like it could happen, but it probably won't. You know, I think there's probably a greater chance of like getting into a car crash on my way to the swimming pool um, than there is of getting attacked by a shark. Um, so yeah, you just put it out of your head and deal with it when it comes up. Um, jellyfish are a lot more likely, right? Most, you know, most of the places I've swum have jellyfish. So I've been stung a few times. Um, you know, it's not comfortable, but like, it's not horrid. You know, there are species of jellyfish out there that are worse than others. So I've been lucky to not have run into some of the nastier ones. Um, but yeah, you run into them, you, they bounce off and you get on with your day. <laughs> You do. You get on with your day. <laughs> I'm not sure if all of us here would be able to say, yeah, you know, I just got stung and then kept going. So again, that speaks to your mental strength. That's so incredible. And I would love to talk about the mental strength through your uh, breast cancer for a moment, if 
if you're comfortable with us exploring that, I think that the challenge you went through and then to bounce back and be continue swimming afterwards. And my favorite podcast I heard with you speaking was when you did, was it a day after you got cleared by the doctor, you went and did a 10 K here at horse tooth. Like that is amazing. And I, I would love so that everyone else knows what I'm referencing. I'd love you to share that story because it really made me laugh when I listened to it, but could you maybe speak to, you know, your mental strength is incredible. Not all of us would be able to swim for 67, let alone 12 hours and work through those fears of um, maybe sharks or jellyfish or any of those challenges. And so I'm sure that your mental strength supported you through that journey. And I'd love to hear how you feel that that, that came into play and, and whether you felt that it did. Yeah, I mean, so... I got diagnosed with breast cancer like three months after I finished my Lake Champlain 100 mile swim. Um, and I was 35. Um, I'd already had this four way English Channel swim books. There's shockingly a wait list to swim the English Channel. Most people don't realize that, but there's usually at least a couple of years um, to wait before you can swim the English Channel. So, you know, I was training for this Lake Champlain swim. I had the English Channel on the books, um, knew it was coming up. Um, I had all these like training swims planned for 2018 um, that I was going to do to get ready for this English Channel four-way. And so like, you know, I was just kind of like riding high, you know, like I had just completed like the greatest, you know, swimming feat of my life, you know, and, you know, comfortable with my body, you know, just like really feeling like I was coming into my own. And then you just like get a major kick in the gut, right? Like, why is this happening to me? Like, what did I do? You know, like, why me? Like, we don't have any family history. Like, I obviously, I don't meet any of the, like, environmental factors for it. Um, we did all the genetic testing, and I have no genetic, um, you know, there's, there was just no, like, no real reason, you know, we'll never know why I got breast cancer. Um, and so I cried a lot, I'm not gonna lie. There was a lot of tears. I was mad, um, really upset, um, clearly. Um, but at some point you have to kind of let it go, right? Cause you can't change it. And so it's either move forward or die. Um, and my choice was move forward. Um, I had great support in my husband. Um, you know, he was like there every single step of the way. Um, I didn't go to a single chemo session alone. I have a great swim community here. Um, and we pretty much had a party in chemo every week, I think. Um, you know, so just really lucky to have so many good people like supporting me um, when I went through it. And then I swam through most of my treatment. Um, I think I had said like in the past, just like, oh, I could give up swimming if I wanted to. I don't need it. Um, well, if cancer taught me anything, it's that I really, really need to swim. And so, you know, swimming, you know, during chemo, um, you know, swimming three or four days a week um, during chemo, obviously not like training hard, but in the water and moving and, you know, doing what I love with my friends. And, you know, I think just having that routine and that normalcy, um, like I can go jump in the water and I can put a swim cap on and no one knows that I don't have any hair under my swim cap. Um, and I think that helped just so much having that looks like mental outlet, that physical outlet of doing something that was like beyond cancer. You know what I mean? Like this is I'm not thinking about cancer today. I'm going to go for a swim. Um, it's really interesting when you're talking to um, oncologists and surgeons and radiologists um, and they're talking about treatment plans. And your question is, so I'm going to swim like 80 miles next year. Is that going to be possible? <laughs> and they really do look at you really strange uh, when you're like, because they don't know what to do with you, right? They've never had someone walk in the door and say like, I've swum a hundred miles last year and I would like to do that in the future. Is that going to be possible for me? They don't know the answer. Um, you don't know how your body's going to react to chemo. You don't know what the surgeries are going to do. You just, you just don't know. Um, and so having that goal, I think, right? Because it wasn't, I mean, a lot of cancer was just like day by day by day, like get through this moment, get through this next treatment. Um, hopefully you're going to feel better tomorrow. Um, but through that all, like I had this English channel swim, like I had to do it. Um, and so, you know, I finished all my treatment. We had a year between the end of treatment and when the English channel swim happened and I was like really ready to go. And so um, 
it was funny because I did radiation at the end. Um, it burned me really, really bad. Um, like the burns were like outrageous. I remember like sending pictures to my mom and my sisters and they're just like, I can't believe that's what's happening to your skin. Um, and so I couldn't swim, obviously, like I'm oozing and blistered and like they don't, you don't want to get in a lake because um, you're going to get an infection. And so um, radiation keeps burning after you're done with it. And so it was like two weeks. Um, and then I'm like, okay, this is maybe getting a little bit better. And I did, I had a, a doctor's appointment with my surgeon on a Friday. Um, and I was like, there's this race and I had been targeting it like in my mind mentally, like I knew when it was, I knew it was, and like, I wanted to do it so bad. Um, and so I did, I went into the doctor and I'm like, check me out. Like, you know, it's like, look at like, am I cleared enough? And he's like, well, there's like this little spot, but you know, put some like Neosporin on it when you're done and you're good to go. And so that was on a Friday. And then I swam this 10 K race on a, on a Sunday. Um, you know, it was like my slowest 10 K at horse shoot that I've ever done. And like, it was the most brilliant thing that I've ever done. You know, my husband was in a kayak next to me um, and we were just smiling and laughing the whole time. You know, I made the race director start me like in the very last way, very last. And um, so I could just take it all in and enjoy it. And it was, it was just like this beautiful moment of like, you know what? I beat cancer, you know, like that, you know, people always ask you like, when, when's your cancer anniversary? Like, when did you say, you know, when did the doctor tell you? For me, it's the day that I swam horse tooth and that means that I beat it and it wasn't going to get me down and it reset me for the year. And I'm like, all right, I can swim a 10 K today. I'm going to go 84 miles a year from now. That is incredible. I have goosebumps just hearing, just imagining that moment in horse tooth. That's so beautiful. And just to know that you held on to that and just to have that moment of freedom, because clearly water is your happy place and just that's that's so incredible that's so incredible it, yeah oh wow that's a thank you for sharing that I can't imagine the difficulty of that challenge but I think it's just so inspiring for all for everyone and if we all had different challenges yours was incredibly challenging but we can continue to do those little steps like you said sometimes it was day by day sometimes it was like nope I'm still doing the English channel in a year and that's what I'm gonna do that is so so cool so thank you for sharing that and uh I want to keep an eye on the chat no no more questions I am curious so I noticed that you have done a cook straight swim and as a kiwi mm -hmm. obviously my eyes shot to that one <laughs> yep so the cook straight is the New Zealand has three islands but two are the main inhabited islands and in the middle of the islands there is a gap and if you are most people if you need to get across the gap, you either fly or you use the ferry, <laughs> which you can drive on or walk on. And Sarah swam it, which is super cool. And so I'd love to just hear a little bit about that experience because I know that the cook straight can get really choppy. So just curious, what, what, what was that one like for you? Yeah, that one was a major adventure. Um, that was my first one back from cancer. I did that like six months after my cancer treatment. Again, it had been scheduled because um, there's a wait list to swim the cook straight. And so it, it had been scheduled for a couple of years and I was like, I have to do it. You know, it's six months after cancer and it's six months before the English channel. So I'm gonna go. Um, I was not in the best shape um, that I could have been in because I was still recovering from all my cancer treatments. Um, and so we went over, um, they give you a weather window and we had like this one little teeny tiny window where the weather was supposed to cooperate. Um, I was hoping for like a nine to 10 hour crossing of the Cook Strait. Um, the weather was really great for about two hours oh. and then it was really not great. Um, it was, it was really a rough crossing. Oh, um, there was a, no. Yeah, there was another girl who started at the same time as I did. Um, she swam for about 12 hours. She was about my speed. So we should have been done at 12 hours. So she got out at 12 hours. Mm -hmm. um, she was puking. I was puking from swallowing salt water. Um, really just like, what am I doing? Like, am I going to have what it takes to go to the English Channel in six months? Because this is brutal. Um, and then somewhere in the middle of it, you know, the, the boat guy is like, talking to my husband and he's like I don't know if we should let her keep swimming you know this is getting to be a long swim you know we we're at like 14 hours and then my husband's like she swam 100 miles <laughs> and he was like oh well let's just put a light on her head and we'll see what happens 
<laughs> and so they just let me swim into the into the dark. Um, I was lucky in that swim that the jellyfish didn't come out to play. Um, kind of in the middle of the afternoon, this gigantic pot of dolphins came. I've never swum with so many dolphins in my life. Um, oh, and they were just beautiful. hundreds of them everywhere, jumping and swimming. And so like the swim was crazy and terrible, but like beautiful and exactly what I needed um, when I did it. So um, the ferry is great, but you don't see the dolphins <laughs> like that if you're on the ferry. <laughs> No, you have the most the most intimate experience by yeah. swimming it. That's yeah. yeah, man. As a New Zealander, I feel I must apologize for the choppiness of that swim. <laughs> it is renowned for being choppy. I've had yeah. my, like, my sister's gone across that ferry and got extreme vertigo yeah. from it, and yeah. it's rough. It was it, yeah, it was rough. We had um like a inflatable like rib zodiac boat that was next to me, um, and it like. I kept looking up, like I kept thinking it was going to like flip over on top of me. And I kept like swimming away from it because I was like terrified it was going to come crashing down on me. Um, and like, you know, my husband's like 10 feet over me, like in this little boat. And we were just, um, oh. it, was, it was rough. It was so rough. But yeah, I think we ended up at like 15 hours or something that I thought was going to take like nine or 10 because um, it, was, it was awful. <laughs> but it was beautiful too, you know, like you know, we got through it. That's what you do sometimes. Sometimes you just got to gut it out. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's, that's crazy. Someone saying, take the dolphin story. For sure. There was, there was a silver lining. That sounds yes. beautiful. And I know New Zealand does have some amazing ocean life. So I'm yes, sure that would have just sure. been such a breathtaking moment. Yeah. It was amazing. The 10 feet waves. <laughs> yeah, they were, it was huge. It was crazy. <laughs> Wow, that is wild. So when you get to the end of a swim like that or any of your long ones, what what is your first thing? I, I feel like I've read some stuff about cold swimming and you can't shower right after. So I'm guessing that's not the first thing you do. So are you craving like fries to get your salt back? You know, what's, what's your plan when you get out? Yeah, it depends so much on the swim. Um, like if you've been in salt water, you don't want salty stuff because um, you've like, your mouth is not happy with you. Sure. Um, I mean, truly my number one priority when I get out is like, I just want to be dry. You know, that's what I start fantasizing about towards the end. I'm like, I just want to put like a coat on <laughs> and like just be warm and dry for a minute. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'm not super hungry when I get done. So there's not usually like a rush to eat food. Um, usually the boat ride back is long enough that by the time you get home, you do really just want to take a shower and scrub all the nastiness off of the day um, and then just go to sleep and take a nap. <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame you. I feel like I would need a nap after your training sessions, <laughs> let alone uh, some of your long races. That's that's so unbelievable. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. That is, and I even just from playing in the waves, when I get salt in my mouth, I am not happy. So I actually can't fathom how your lips would feel after that. That's that's really quite incredible. I've noticed in some of your photos that you have, is it sunscreen that's the really thick white substance on your face? Yep. Um, basically it's um, decadent. So like oh. baby diaper rash cream, it has like really high concentration of zinc in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I use it for sunscreen because um, it like does not let anything through. Um, but it's nasty and messy and like when you get done you're like get this stuff off of me it has um, such a distinct smell I don't yes. know what I can't remember why I've had to use that before but yeah. it, it, it the smell like infiltrates everything yes <laughs> yes it's very triggering to me so like I just like pull out the tube and I'm like all right it's time to go for a swim <laughs> So like, that's just what that smell means. Um, probably means something very different to people with children. <laughs> that's so crazy. Oh my gosh. And do you have to use, what about uh, as a, again, as a swimmer, and this is a very specific question for someone that isn't used to being in training suits, but what about like the chafing under your armpits and stuff? How do you get through that? Yes, um, I use lanolin. So like I like lather on grease, um, like in my armpits and like where my swimsuit goes. Um, because it's bad like that's probably the worst thing you're like my armpits are on fire um and this is maybe tmi too but um, we're all friends now <laughs> by this really? point um but especially for saltwater swims i just grow out my armpit hair um and that seems to help because guys don't chase under there nearly as much as girls do huh. 
Um, so I, if I just don't shave my armpits for like a couple of weeks, and um, that seems to really help the chafing in the armpits too. Um, so between that and like tons and tons of just like lanolin, goopy, like really thick Vaseline, basically, um, it helps a lot because that's the word. It, it's so miserable to swim when you're all chafed up. Yeah, there you go. If anyone's going to go do a long distance yeah. swim, grow out your armpit here. I love <laughs> yeah. that. That's such a specific note. Yeah. <laughs> yes, pro tips over here. <laughs> oh, for sure. So what about, have you ever had any swims where it's been planned and then it didn't work? Like, I guess you, you mentioned with the Cook Straight one that there was a specific window. So that might have changed your start time. Has there ever, ever been times where you've had to wait an entire day? Or how do you deal with those changes and um, uh, almost train for the mental strength of being able to roll with, mm -hmm. oh, the plan's changed? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's tough. Like when you do a lot of these swims, they give you a window. Um, and so you don't really know exactly like what day you're going to swim. Um, the first time I went to do the English Channel in 2012, um, we actually went to England for two weeks and the weather was terrible the whole time. Um, and we just went home, um, like didn't even like get a chance to try. I think one swimmer went in that whole two week period because the weather was just so rotten. Um, and then I got, you know, I was home for like maybe a week and my boat captain called and he's like, hey, someone dropped out. The weather's looking great. Do you want to come back? And I was like, people don't go to England twice in one summer. Um, <laughs> but then I like you know, talked to my boss at work or whatever. And she was like, go, like, I've watched you train for this, like, go get out of here. Um, so we did, we went back and the weather was beautiful and, you know, it worked out perfectly the second time around. So um, that, I think that's part of it is like, the weather's bad. There's no point in forcing it, right? It's not going to be safe. Um, and a boat a boat captain's not going to put you out in unsafe conditions that you can't make it. So that's part of the mental piece of it. It's like, it's hard to let it go sometimes, but it's better to, you know, save it and come back another day and hopefully have better conditions, have another chance to do it um, at a different time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Especially if, you justify the safety part of it, right? right. It, it would be frustrating and it's hard, especially if your food intake or the, your preparation mm -hmm. and being so ready and then having yep. to deal with the changes, it, it's hard to deal with changes for anything. You know, if our yep. plans change, it's, it's, it's annoying or it's frustrating or yep. it messes up yep. our plans, but, yep. but your, your plans, when they change, that's, that's a big deal. And so I'm yep. sure um, that, again that just goes back to that mental strength and being able to if you bring in the safety aspect and, and talk okay. through the different elements of why it's had to be right. changed yeah um, it's tough I have a lot of superstitions um, built in around that now like I don't like prepare any of my like swim gear until like the day before um wow. that way I don't have to like unpack it or um I'm not wasting anything um so I just have like all these like just things that I do because yeah, because you might not get to swim, and you go, if you go into it knowing like this is open water, it's nature, um, it's part of it. Um, it's a lot easier to deal with than like, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to swim. This is how it's going to happen. Like you just have to let go of some control sometimes. Just hard for me because I like to be in control. Sure, but but even to have that you've set that uh, uh, tradition or sort of preparation steps for yourself, and by doing that, you're accepting that it might change so so you've you've given yourself that space to sort of be okay with the changes and so making that decision to be okay or maybe not happy but be ultimately right. okay with it changing so that's right. that's really cool to even you know acknowledge those things and set set yourself those steps that if it does change it's okay and you from the start are sort of preparing for that so that's uh it's just all about those little steps and just rolling with it but at the same time digging deeper than I feel many of us know how to dig I just I think it's so incredible that your motivation isn't to be the what was the label like the world's best ultra marathon swimmer it was to see what you could do and I think that that is so inspiring and if and if we continue to make ourselves better and it's not necessarily just about competing and beating the person over there like what can we do and I heard you talk in I think it might have been the same podcast as uh 
the horse tooth story, but um, you talked about just being a good human and you kept saying that word. And I, I really resonated with that. And I'd love for you to share with us what it, what is a good human? And you, you said in that podcast that you want to be a good human. And so I would love to hear a little more about that because I really like that. Yeah. I mean, I try to live my life that way, you know, just, um, there's a lot of nastiness out in the world and I don't need to be a part of it, you know? And I just think we can be good humans by just like doing our best. Um, I know that's really cliche, but um, you know, some of the, like, I try, like if someone emails me and asks for some advice, I try my like very best to answer their questions and help them out. You know, if people help me out along the way. I wouldn't be where I was at if people hadn't given me a hand and pulled me along and told me everything that they know. So I really do like to kind of give back to my sport in that way, because I want other people to be successful at it. I don't want to be the last person to ever swim a hundred miles. Um, you know, I, I hope that I'm around um, and, you know, helping the person who does swim hundred miles next um, because I just feel like that pulls us all forward. Not just, you know, it doesn't hurt me. You know, I did it. <laughs> like I don't need to do it again. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that there's a lot of ways that we can get back and help each other out. Um, one of the things I learned a lot when I was going through cancer um, is like, there's a lot that can divide us, right? Like, when you look at politics or just, I mean, there's a lot of things out there that pull us apart. But when I was sick, like there was people from all around the world, you know, sending me packages, care packages, or like nice messages and like, you know, wishing me the best. And it's like, why can't we pull together like that all the time? It shouldn't take someone being sick. Um, but there's so much good in the world. I think one guy posted a picture of his dogs every day on my Facebook timeline for a year. Um, you know, like, he didn't cost him a thing other than that he thought about me once a day for an entire year. Um, and like, that's a good human. You know, it doesn't take money. It doesn't take anything special other than just like having a kind thought for somebody um, when you don't have to. And I think, you know, that's just a good way to live. I love that. I love that. And anytime there's dog photos involved, it <laughs> is great, right? 100%. <laughs> For sure. Oh, I love that. I just want to let everyone know that I've provided you the option to unmute yourselves now. So if you did have a question and uh, would prefer to speak it as opposed to type it, please feel free to unmute yourself because you should have the capacity to do that now. If you want to ask Sarah a question about any, any part of her journey or amazing mental strength. Um, but I guess if, while we're seeing if anyone wants to ask questions, if someone wants to have you join, uh, you know, if they're having an event and uh, I would hope everyone's inspired by you because <laughs> what you've done is incredible. But if they, you know, if they want to have you as a speaker on an event, how, how can they find you? How can they learn more about you? Yeah. Um, the website crazy. Um, like I never thought I'd be a person who had a website, but I do have a website. You can message me on that. It's um, Sarah with an H, so S-A-R-A-H, sarahthomasswims.com is my website. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's sarahswims04, um, Instagram. I think it's the same on my Twitter, but I don't use Twitter a whole lot. I'm on Facebook too, so I'm pretty easy to find if you want to. Um, but yeah, if you go to my website, there's places you can email me. Um, so yeah, I would love to speak to a group or do a Zoom or whatever you got going on. It'd make me very happy. Love that. Okay. Well, I just put your website link into the chat too, in case anyone wants to take it, click it and just go right into your website. So hopefully we can get you some more gigs because I think that sharing your story is so awesome and just to inspire new swimmers or even again, different parts of life. You, I truly feel that your story isn't, doesn't need to just relate to swimming. It can be applied to any part of life. And we do have a question who inspires you and we didn't cover this so they said sorry if we covered it they're doing late but we haven't covered this is there is there external inspiration obviously you really are motivated by finding your limits and that's amazing but do you have external inspirations yeah that's a good question I mean there's a lot of like fantastic swimmers out there in the world um you know sometimes I like follow some of like the older women um, and I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, I want to be, you know, in my 60s and 70s and still doing this. So you know, I'm 100% inspired by those people who are just still out there doing it. Um, 
you know, sometimes my husband likes to tell me that I'm too old to do this. Um, he know he knows better now, but he's tried that a couple of times. Um, and it's like, you know what? I'm not ever going to be too old to be doing this. And like, you can take a look at these women over here. So totally inspired by those types of people who um, maybe aren't the fastest, who aren't the greatest, but they're still like following their dreams and their passions. So anytime I can find people who are doing that, that's kind of like what gets me motivated because I'm in it for the long haul. Um, and I appreciate that other people are too. I love that when I was a club swimmer, we used to do, we had a couple of times where I believe it was like the Masters World Champs. I was really young, so I'm digging deep into my memory banks here, but we would do volunteer timekeeping. And I really mm -hmm. I do think it was the World Masters at one point that we hosted in Christchurch, New Zealand. And mm -hmm. there was a 100 year old that did the 800. And that yeah. was the, and that part is so clear in my mind, yeah. just how cool. They're not doing yeah. it for anyone. They're doing it for themselves. They're yeah. doing it because they can and they want to and they've chosen to. And I can totally yeah. see how that's an inspiration because they just are awesome. Like that is so mm -hmm. cool. Yes. <laughs> so, so cool. That was a great question. So thank you, Susan, for asking that because we had not covered that. If anyone else has any other questions, we got just a couple of more minutes left. So feel free to sneak it in. Otherwise we'll let, Sarah get away with her night in Denver it's a, we've had a beautiful day in Colorado here very nice and sunny we had mm -hmm. sideways snow two days ago and now we've got warm warm sun mm -hmm. yep I checked out the lake last Saturday and there we a few of us got in for a few minutes there was still like a, a thin sheet of ice on part of the lake and um, so I'm really looking forward from this like warm weather um, I think on, we're going to go back on Saturday and I think it'll be completely ice free. And I'm like, so pumped. I'm like, I'm going to get in. It's going to be so cold. Don't even ask. Um, but it's going to be amazing. So I've been like relishing this like sunshine the last couple of days because it can only help. Totally. And I'm sure that uh, over the winter period, you can't be swimming in, in unless you travel, of course, mm -hmm. but yeah. locally, you're not getting that freedom feeling of being in open water because admittedly you don't get that as much if you're going up and down a lane uh in chlorinated water indoors <laughs> mm -hmm. and call so, it the chlorine torture box <laughs> oh yeah i know the chlorine it i feel like it's probably the same with your smell with the uh sunscreen that you use you yes. know it just elicits this deep response <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes it does <laughs> I was, uh, I don't swim much very anymore, but I was present for the opening day of No More Unders free uh, learn to swim program last week and walking in, I hadn't been in a pool in quite mm. a few years and walking in, it was a very powerful emotion that it brought to the surface. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> so, so many it, memories in that smell. <laughs> oh yeah. Memories, dry skin, yes. a lack of eyebrows. Yes, like, I had to pencil mine in for us today because yeah. it's quite lacking at the moment. <laughs> like people aren't going to be, I have my light, my hair is light anyway. And so I've been in the pool so much this winter. I'm like, I don't have any eyebrows left. It's <laughs> They're a gone. thing. Yeah. It's, it's a thing. It's a real thing. Oh my yeah. gosh, that's so funny. Well, I guess we must have covered the juicy stuff because we don't have any additional questions. So I just... Thank you again, Sarah, for sharing your stories and your steps to achieving these incredible things, but starting off in such in a place where we can all start. And then, you know, seeing where you grew from learning to swim, learning to love the lake, a 10K through to the 167K, it's just incredible. So thank you for sharing the importance of those steps and your inspirations and your mental strength, I think that it's just amazing. And I hope that we can all take a little bit away from this conversation.